Working in a studio isn't always a glamorous proposition. I think it's often really romanticized to the point of where it's not the reality. The reality is art is made up by people covered in paint, sweaty, and working under some difficult circumstances. You know, sometimes I think, why did I do this? And then I think, I can't do anything else. And I still have a certain passion for it, a certain um, love of the craft, and I always have. So painting is very, making art, writing, that's all very critical to me. And I think quite often, there aren't a lot of venues for artists to express themselves, and it's extremely difficult finding the support. I've been a little luckier than most in that I've had a few sales, and I really do appreciate the people that buy the work more than they probably know, and those that are about to, but it's a really small group. You know, the most vast majority of people see a show, they have a glass of wine or an appetizer, and they just walk on by, and they never think about all the effort that went into it on the part of the artist, and to some extent the gallery owners. And in Phoenix, and even in Scottsdale, there's this real entrenched view that arts will never profit and that no one's ever going to buy it and there's it's just very deeply entrenched and I think that it can but it has to be very good and it has to be presented properly and the people into it have to really know what they're doing and I think it's also about delineating responsibility because right now artists are expected to pay for the work store it pay fees to enter competitions that are not refundable if they don't get in then they have a percentage of their sales that go to the gallery for overhead. And in some cases, the artists are responsible for their own PR, their own invitations, even hanging the shows. So basically, the artist becomes a one-man band, and they have to do their PR and find patrons. Not all galleries run that way, but that's the model that a lot of space, that a number of spaces operate on. And unfortunately, spaces are coming and going left and right. And my theory is you have to find the right work, the right audience, the right PR, and the right pieces. And how you do that is really simple. You just go for quality and then the rest will fall into place. But it's not easy and I don't want to be pithy about it. Another thing too is I don't really want to talk about sales that much, but you know, I have to plea and beg to get money. So if you want to donate to the cause, you know, whatever, buy a piece or just you feel bad and guilty, you know, I'm accepting anything to get by because my house, which is my studio, might be repossessed. I'm fighting like a bulldog to keep it and, you know, fighting some physical as well as mental issues which are under control thanks to uh, psychiatry. I mean, it's not like people think about bipolar. It's not, you know, you don't go out in the street and just do crazy things. Now, if you get off your meds or don't have meds or have proper health care, you know, you might do some things that will get you into some trouble. And, you know, I've had to really fight that and fight the misconceptions about it. Just like you fight the misconceptions about being an artist. People have this very romanticized view of the artist, you know, this it's just very romanticized. I think the reality is more interesting, the kind of people that make art, than the necessarily the Hollywood vision. And you know, I'm working really hard to kind of get the work out there, show people my studio, try to sell the pieces, and just keep my house. Because like a lot of Americans, there are just no jobs out here. I mean, and here's what really sent me over the top, really did send me into the top, and it's one of the reasons why I got help. I had applied for a position and was teaching these part-time courses, and I was offered two more and that would have put me in a very good position and it would have been enough income to probably help me save my house so I'm really excited and to make to add insult to injury it was a place I wanted to teach and they invited me and they were one of the best systems in the entire Maricopa County system it was a really good system and I really liked this particular campus I thought great I can serve my community in South Mountain I can go up and share my insights in Glendale and Glendale once made me artist of the month so that was really nice I always had a good reception up there so I thought this is just a great opportunity and I love teaching but there was a limit as to how much you could teach the credits for adjunct faculty and they couldn't make any exceptions and then to make things even worse they said these prep classes are probably going to go unfilled and students are going to be deprived of an art class because the county's decided that adjuncts can't have you know full loads so these classes are going to be they're going to disappear and it's going to make it worse because you're going to have this glut of students because a lot of people are going to school right now and they really need art and culture and they're not getting it and it's just a sad situation all the way around. One of the things that I run into as an educator is I run into people coming to my classes from the high schools and they just aren't trained. I mean, they're coming to me in these weird positions where they know nothing and I have to fill in all the gaps and teach them art and 
try to generate some enthusiasm, which makes your job that much harder. I mean, people look at art history and they go with a collective yawn, and I'm trying to aliven it. I do what I call the TMZ version of art, where I talk about some of the more salacious and scandalous parts of artists' lives to really bring people in to realize these are human beings with fascinating stories to tell, and they're not just dead pieces of history. And if we look at history, we can learn so much about the present, we can probably remedy some of the problems because history does repeat itself. And the patterns and trends, we can see them right now, but unless you understand history and art, you can't see them. And art to me, at its best, is a mirror of society. What its concerns were, are, what people were thinking, how they were thinking, and how the socioeconomic influences comes into art. And if you think it does, and it really does. So I think of all art as being a, a record of what went on in a given culture. But unfortunately right now, our culture is very deprived of imagery. We're shutting art to the background where it's just a project that the elite enjoy. And the public is left out of the mix and the public isn't even trained about how to look at the arts. And I'm seeing this all across the world, this, this de-education of the public. And it's not their fault they don't know, they're just not given the information. So you're seeing this really interesting pattern where people aren't being informed about history, they're not learning about art, they're not learning about music, they're not getting the basic sciences, they have no idea what the world's like, they're trained for this very, very narrow scope of things. They look at college as a trade school. And so therefore, they're not going to be able to look outside themselves to other disciplines to help them understand the world. And to make it worse, they don't even know when their health issues or mental health issues because they're not even trained to identify those. We live in a culture where there are probably thousands of people with mental health issues that can be cured, well not cured, but helped, given long-term assistance, and they're not getting it because they don't even know, because we haven't talked about what constitutes sanity, you know, what constitutes a good mental health issue, or what is considered a normal, it's considered something that can get you into a lot of anguish. And we live right now in a society where almost anything goes. I mean, anything. And we're not teaching people to watch out for the signs. So it's almost like we're going on this toboggan ride. There are no jobs. People are unemployed. They're getting frustrated. It's acerbating whatever mental health issues they had and just the desperation amongst those that don't. And we're careening toward, I think, more and more violence and more and more problems. And it's just stewing. And at some point, I don't know or if it will explode. But while all this is going on, we're all tentatively hanging on to what little we have, and we see more and more of what we've worked for disappear. And that's true for the arts like everyone else. So, you know, I'm kind of like, like a lot of people, you know, putting my hat out, hoping that somebody puts something in the hat. And it's not a proud position to be in, but we're all in that. And I think if we can band together and talk to people in office and really vote, you know, maybe we can change things. You know, maybe we can make an impact. I mean, one voice can have a huge impact when it's loud enough and long enough. But, you know, we really need to do something. Because I see a lot of homeless people, and they're all people with mental health issues. I don't think they'd be... We kind of take that attitude that they're there because they want to be there. That couldn't be anything further from the truth. And some of them, like myself, you know, might descend into that once we've lost everything. When you've lost your home, job, your self-esteem, and your sanity, what else is left to go except the streets? And that's a horrible reality people are dealing with. And, you know, I think my art talks about that to some extent. So let me show you. Okay, I promised you the studio, so here it is. This is my favorite candy. I love belly flops. For some reason, I love them because they're not perfect. And they were the discards. And I have a thing about things being discarded. So the belly flops are kind of a metaphor for me, something that's discarded, you know. So I love my belly flops. I like them more than I do the regular Jelly Bellies. So that's something I always love. And that's, these are the paints, you know, my acrylic paints and my brushes. And I had an OCD issue. I buy all these brushes every day and never use them. You know, you can still see some of them in the package, right? So it was really hard for me to break out of that and use these brushes. So I slowly but surely started to use them, you know. And I don't know why I didn't do it earlier, why I was so, you know, antsy, but I just thought, I'll save them for a better painting. I'll save them. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to use them if I keep taking this attitude. So I used them. And here are the paints that I love, my Goldens, you know. Here's some acrylic paint that were given to me by a former friend, you know, along with the dinner jacket so I could look nice at openings, but never heard from them again, but appreciate the contribution. Um, <laughs> here's a painting that's black that's going to be covered in color. This is a painting that's just too gimmicky for me to deal with. 
So it's going to come less gimmicky. I put some surface texture on it, but I didn't really like the outcome, but there were certain segments I liked. So this is a challenge. Plus I'm running short on canvases. This is one that is brand new and it's not finished, but I really love it because I'm bringing the figure back in a la Giacometti and then bringing in my cactuses and really talking about the present. So it's a whole painting about being spinning around and spinning around and being agitated and having all these forces spin you around and feeling sort of helpless and in despair. But I wanted to have bright colors to do it. So you're going to see a very different painting when it comes about. Here's another one in process, just a blue surface. I like blue, so I wanted to work against that. Black. And then I love this one. It's just a little too derivative, but it will go through some changes and this will be more like a backdrop. You know, they're being really quiet, which is usually weird. When I walk around the house, they're usually like barking like crazy. I guess they must have an idea that I'm filming because that's so unusual for them not to bark. Okay, the color is changing here because I need to do the white balance. So I'm going to do the white balance. Okay, here's a painting that I'm working on. I don't know if it's finished or not because it, it's so hard to figure out when they're done or when they're ready, you know, for public consumption. But this one has been sitting around for a while, so... I'm not really sure, but it just it just has an incomplete quality. There are parts of it, segments of it I like, but I think it can be richer. You know, so I'm gonna try to work it. This one over here, and Bruce, my other other half here and major critic, saw this one and said it's done. And I stopped because I felt like I, I felt like, you know, I'm at a stopping point. So I took his advice and quit. You know, because I really wanted to work on it some more, but I thought, you know, if I work on it anymore, I think it's gonna look pat. And it's not going to look, it's not going to have its rawness. And he said it was one of my most focused paintings. It didn't have too much going on in it. You know, because some of the paintings were getting really, really busy. And this one has a little more focus, a lot, a lot more discipline. You know, I could be able to stand back and really work on this painting in a really constructive way. So it really, in a lot of ways, helped me a lot. So this is my little tour of the studio. This is the house. You can see that. There, there's one of the dogs, the dachshund. Uh, that's... The mixed breed Chihuahua and Jack Russell, and that's Rupert the Chihuahua. You know, they're being really quiet, which is usually weird. When I walk around the house, they're usually like barking like crazy. I guess they must have an idea that I'm filming because that's so unusual for them not to bark. Okay, the color is changing here because I need to do the white balance. So I'm going to do the white balance. The reason why, do, why anybody does the white balance is because they want to, want to make sure the colors come out properly or else you wind up with yellow and orange pictures. But this is the whole studio. It's a table. I had a really nice dining table, but we sold it so we could kind of get by. So I'm really sorry to see that. But one of the things I kept was this counter. It's all handmade, wooden. It's actually a beautiful piece of furniture. Here are the rugs. And underneath here, this is really bizarre. Someone actually gave this to me. It was an Andy Warhol carpet, and it's jet black, so it's really a nightmare to take care of, but I didn't know Andy Warhol created a carpet. And it was given to me as a gift. Oh, that's one of my rags. It used to be some pajamas. Um, I don't want to be too distorted, but this carpet underneath, I covered it because it became so black, and it was just a nightmare. You had to vacuum the thing every day, and I just got tired of it. Uh, this is the Brancusi inspired piece and normally I wouldn't show this on a video because I've shown it so many times but I really like that painting a lot. This is one that's going to go back to the factory. This one is my homage to Egon Schiele. This is my homage to veterans everywhere and this is my Leon Golub every man, every woman, anybody who's had a loved one go come back from the war damaged and it had a lot of resonance for me because I had relatives fighting in World War I I mean, World War II, and, you know, they, these men were coming back homeless. I mean, it was really tragic, and everybody talks about war like it's so glorious. And, you know, it's, you know, we, I think the world should just get together and say, no more of this foolishness. You know, whatever disagreements we have, you know, let's agree to disagree and try to make the world a better place rather than everybody hating and bombing each other to death. You know, I know that sounds really simple, like, can't we all get along? But, you know, maybe, maybe that isn't such a bad sentiment. Why can't we all just get along? Um... Here's the studio again. You know, I love this space. That's, I swear, to, I swear, I actually went on the phone and said, if you take this space, it's over my dead body. Because I love this house. And it's not just the house, it's the studio part. And the fact that, you know, I struggled for 10 years to get my own home. And I lost one. I had to sell my grandparents' house because my grandmother had Alzheimer's. And, 
you know, I couldn't afford it. And I thought, you know, I could stay here in Louisville, but I'm not really a great caretaker. I'm still in my late, or late 20s, early, early 30s. And I was taking on a job in another city. But I knew these people wanted to take care of her. And I knew that she would get the best care, but it meant giving up the house. So I give it up. It wasn't my house. And I thought, well, it's for my grandmother's best interest to do this. Everybody's, you know. And so it was sold, which was really sad. And I swore to myself I'd never lose a house again. And the irony is I wind up, you know, 15 years later and I'm looking at a house going up. But um, I'm struggling like crazy, you know. But it's not lack of effort, believe me. People say, oh, we're all being lazy in America and we're not working. And artists are just lazy, you know, and they don't want to do anything. And they just paint pretty pictures and hope for the best. And I'm here to tell you, oh, that is not the reality. Anyhow, I know this is like a big commercial for me, but you know, sometimes when you're in desperate times, they require desperate actions. So, you know, anybody that's interested, let me know. And, you know, I have friends too, you know, but that, that are struggling too with their art, you know, but I have to start fixing myself before I can help other people. Anyhow, once I get on my, I, I warned myself that once I got myself together, I would really spend some effort helping other people because that's what I did before. I did a lot of public service in my community. And I enjoyed doing it, and it was a real pleasure to do it, but, you know, even that cost. So, you know, when people think picking up trash and covering up graffiti is easy, it's not. You know, it's just difficult. So this is my studio. This is where I live and work. Those are my wingback chairs that might be going up for sale, so if you want some wingbacks, let me know. <laughs> and um, my old trusty laptop. This thing, I'll tell you what, Gateway makes a really good laptop. This thing has survived six years, at least at least six years. Anyhow, that's my, this is my studio. Those are some other pieces. If you want to see more artwork, I have pieces up at www.com, bearmanart.com, www.bearmanart.com, so you can see more pieces. Thank you so much for your time. Spread the word. I wish this video would go viral. You know, somehow that sounds weird when you say viral. It sounds like, you know, a virus. You know, something that's a bad thing. But, you know, I like to see people watch and see the work and appreciate the work, you know. But I'm a very modest person. I know that sounds weird to people that know me, but I'm basically modest, you know. I have to thank my father for giving me the ability to do this and my grandmother for taking me to art classes. So I really owed them a big, big debt of gratitude. And then my grandfather for trying to help pay for my tuition at Cranbrook. Um, have a good one. Take care.